being recorded. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today for the fifth webinar in our year-long COVID Commons webinar series, Taking Back Control During COVID-19. I'm Nate Wade, your host for today, and I'm the Senior Director for Strategic Initiatives at ASU's College of Health Solutions. I co-lead our college's COVID-19 Diagnostics Commons initiative with Mara Aspinall, who will be moderating today's event. Mara is a professor of practice at ASU's College of Health Solutions and a diagnostics industry expert who helped found our master's degree in biomedical diagnostics. She is also an advisor to the Rockefeller Foundation on testing and reopening schools. Mara and I would first like to recognize and thank the Rockefeller Foundation for their generous support of our COVID Commons initiatives. We would also like to thank our partners at the World Economic Forum who have been instrumental in helping us with all aspects of our workplace commons initiatives. Before introducing our panelists, a few housekeeping items. First, this session is being recorded and it will be posted on our website, asucovidcommons.com. Next, we will have a discussion and Q&A session during the last half of this webinar. Please submit your questions using the Q&A feature. We value your feedback and plan to send a brief survey asking for your input about today's webinar and ideas for future event topics. Finally, we encourage you to get involved in our COVID Commons community. After the webinar, please visit asucovidcommons.com and sign up to receive invitations to future webinars, visit Testing Commons and Workplace Commons, view our T3 Testing Technology Trends blog, or provide an employer case study. Now that housekeeping is behind us, I'll turn it over to Mara, who will introduce our speakers. Thank you, Nate, and hello, everyone. Um, welcome to today's webinar. As you know, the roadmap to reopening K through 12 schools. If there is one issue that pervades all of our society, it is getting kids back to in-person school. And just to be clear, all of you probably know this, but the impact is so much larger than just the kids. It clearly affects parents, families, communities, and frankly, the future of the economy. There is no hotter issue today than talking about how and whether to bring kids back to in-person school. So to discuss this, we have three strong and impressive leaders who are known for their decisiveness and leadership before the pandemic and especially now during the pandemic. Our speakers are from all aspects of the educational spectrum, a head of school, and a head of the school superintendent's organization, and a head of the largest school testing providers. So with that, I'm going to introduce each of our panelists. We'll have some time for dialogue and questions from the, I was gonna say, I'll have some questions and questions from the audience. And we're gonna start with Mike McGee. Mike is CEO of Chiefs for Change. Chiefs for Change is one of the largest superintendents organizations in the country. Prior to leading Chiefs for Change, Mike was co-founder and CEO of the Rhode Island Mayoral Academies, REMA. As CEO of the Mayoral Academies, he, he built a statewide network, network of regional, diverse by design, public charter schools while successfully advocating for improvements to state education policy. Before starting the Mayoral Academies, Mike was a teacher himself. He taught American literature and philosophy at Haverford College, Wheaton College, and the Rhode Island School of Design. His book, Emancipating Pragmatism, I love that title, won the Elizabeth Agee Prize in American Studies. He's a 2013 Bahara Aspen Education Fellow and a Bahara Fellowship Moderator. He holds a PhD in English from the University of Pennsylvania and a BA in political science and English from the College of the Holy Cross. Now, Mike, tell us more about Chiefs for Change and how you have worked um, around the issue of reopening K through 12 schools. Well, thank you, Mara. I uh, should say I'm also a parent of three daughters and drove my middle schooler to public school for the first time this year on Wednesday. So uh, I, I feel this as a parent very much. The uh, opportunity that she has to be back with her friends and teachers is a game changer for her. And I know every parent is um, hoping for the same for their children across the US. 
Chiefs for Change uh, supports, as you mentioned, a group of prominent K-12 systems leaders, both state and district superintendents who collectively serve about seven and a half million students across the US. Um, since March, we've been leading a community of practice on pandemic response with them and providing technical assistance to help them think through their own reopening plans. Uh, that included everything they did this past spring to stand up high quality virtual learning um, and to close the digital divide for all of their students. And increasingly, it includes support for them in thinking through their plans to bring all students back to in-person buildings. Uh, as you know, there are enormous challenges there. Um, in the spring, we created a set of tools for them that we call day in the life tools that allow them to pressure test every aspect of their plan, uh, whether it's their virtual learning plans or their in-person plans and everything in between. Um, to just give one very brief example of what that looked like in the spring, if you take something like busing, they had to ask, you know, you have a student named Malik, for example, Malik gets to the bus and has forgotten his mask. Can Malik get on the bus? Does the bus driver have extra masks? If not, does the bus have to wait for someone to pick Malik up? If Malik's brother is there and has a mask, can his brother get on the bus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Hundreds of questions that need to be answered in order to assure that your plan won't fail once it's put under pressure. We feel like there's another moment like this coming where everyone is gonna have to think through how to fully reopen their schools. That's gonna require a different model than the kind of hybrid reopenings that we've seen over the course of this past year. Super Mike, um, if, before we go on to the next panelist, let me ask you a question. How, how have you navigated those issues on a political basis you know, with your organization? Um, it, it's, a gr it's great when you've got a school and a superintendent, teachers and parents who wanna go back but you must have a lot of disagreement about that in getting to the point that you can even debate what Malik is going to do. Absolutely. How have you dealt with that sort of challenge amidst new information coming in all the day, all the time? Sure. Well, Chiefs for Change is a bipartisan network of leaders. They exist in every possible regional and political context in the US. And local politics matter enormously to this. What your governor is saying, what your mayor is saying, what local advocates are saying, it has to be factored into the way that you communicate to the public. What we found is that when good plans fail, they usually fail on comms. So we've tried to provide a lot of support to our members to develop very good communication strategies um, and stakeholder engagement strategies. How are you engaging the community in your decision-making so that they feel like they've had some voice in the process so that they're bought in. Um, and there's been a, a number of different things that we've emphasized there. Obviously Rockefeller Foundation and others have done great work in thinking about what messages resonate when it comes to school safety during the pandemic. Um, and we've tried to incorporate those into our members' communication strategies. But we've also tried to um, support them in their own moral leadership on this issue, for instance, by sticking to the science. One of the hardest things I think during this pandemic has simply been to ground your communications, uh, com your, your communications in the facts about science, um, in the facts about safety. Um, and I think overall our members have done an excellent job with that, but it hasn't been easy. Thanks, thanks, Mike. And we're going to come back to that issue about facts about science and is there interpretation of the facts and and how has that worked in real life? Um, but speaking of real life, you work with so many different school districts. So we wanted to hear directly from an individual school. So with that, I have the pleasure of introducing Susanna Jensby. And Susanna is head of school at the Washington International School, otherwise called, I think, WIS. Um, she came to WIS after six years as serving as the head of the Galloway School in Atlanta. At Galloway, she was recognized for strengthening the academic program and enrollment and upgrading the school's marketing and fiscal planning. 
Prior to Galloway, Susanna was executive director of the Center for Advancement and the Study of International Education. Um, it's an educational nonprofit that provides professional development to both independent and public schools across North America. She also has direct experience with schools. She has 25 years of experience at international and independent schools in the US and Europe. And what I find pretty fascinating and I'm jealous, she speaks four languages and as I understand is perfecting her fifth. Um, Susanna earned a BA and MA degrees in modern and medieval languages, maybe no surprise, um, at the University of Cambridge in the UK. And in 2015, she became a fellow in the head of school program at the Klingenstein Center at Columbia University. She is clearly a polymath. She also attended the London College of Music and is an avid cellist. So with that, let me have the pleasure of introducing Susanna, who, who will give us an overview. And we definitely have some questions for you, Susanna. Thank you, Mara, for that introduction. As you heard, I'm the head of the Washington International School. Yes, we go by WIS. We're a preschool from um, grade, sorry, from preschool all the way through to grade 12. We're a co-educational independent school with 900 students. We're located in Washington, DC. Like most US-based schools, WIS closed for in-person instruction in March 2020 and did not open again for that school year. We were determined to bring back students back on campus this school year as soon as we felt it was reasonably safe to do so, and of course, according to DC guidelines. Our teachers were naturally quite apprehensive about returning to the classroom, so we started this current school year with distance learning. And two weeks into the year, we started bringing our youngest students onto campus for what we call field trips. And on October the 5th, we opened in our current model. Our youngest three grades are on campus every day and grades one through 12 have been divided into two cohorts, which alternate by week for in-person instruction. I'm gonna point out two really important um, aspects of our current model. We've been incredibly fortunate not to experience a decline in enrollment during the pandemic, which means that the current model is the maximum number of students we can bring to campus each day while observing local recommendations regarding classroom capacity, which for DC, we are, we are limited to 11 students and physical distancing of six feet. Another important piece to note is that we brought students and staff back to campus without a testing program in place. We felt the options available at the time in terms of testing would not significantly increase the community's safety, primarily because the lag time between testing and receiving results was, was, was quite significant. Expense and logistics were also critical considerations. But at the time we reopened, we were actively seeking a workable solution and told our community putting a testing program in place was a priority. WIS was quite fortunate to land on the testing program we currently use, which was brought to our attention by a parent at the school. We joined a study joined, uh, which is conducted jointly by United Health Group and the University of Washington to determine if pooling in a pod, as you'll hear it called, if that pooling in a pod testing model could be a cost-effective way to test large groups in a short period of time. The test is a rapid results PCR test, and we have results in about 30 minutes. I'm sure we'll get into the details over the, the next hour, but I will emphasize that the testing program has achieved our goal of keeping the school open. We've had no COVID-related closures. Now, weather closures, a different story, but it really has been uh, phenomenal to, to be open like this. Super, Susanna, thank you for that. Let me, let me ask you one question before we go on to our th third speaker, which is you clearly had a lot of trust amongst your staff, teachers, and parents um, to open without testing and quite frankly, to open it all relatively early uh, compared to other schools. How did you build that trust, especially among skeptics? And have you had a cohort amongst your students who have not come back to school or have you had essentially 100% participation? I'll, I'll start with the last piece. Right from the beginning, we offered a distance learning only model. And at the begin, start of all of this, we had about 14% of our students stay home. Since we've introduced testing, that number has now dropped to uh, just under 7%. So 
we can already see that that testing has built great confidence in the student body. Now for the faculty and staff, there, there wasn't that choice, right? I, I needed to have my teachers in the building in order to be able to, to offer in person. So there was a lot of engagement on the front end um, with both teachers and um, any personnel that were coming to school, as well as with parents. And we, I think Mike talked about this, the communications aspect of really engaging stakeholders. Uh, the associate head of school and myself, we both, uh, we held weekly meetings from, I believe May onwards with uh, parents, with teachers, actually perhaps not as often with teachers, but, but certainly very, very regular points to tell them what we were thinking. Now, uh, a little bit unusual for an independent school, my teachers are in a union, and so there's a collective bargaining unit, and I was uh, able to talk with leadership pretty early on and say what the plan was, and um, they Happen, it's, it just so happens that WIS, that both of them, the co-presidents, happen to be science teachers. And I think they really bought in at the beginning. And um, again, Mike's point, let's base this in science. And I think they could clearly see the, uh, the reasons for why we wanted to come back. And they also bought very much into the, the notion that we would be introducing testing. So I was able to work with them from the get-go, but heavy, heavy engagement yes. and bringing people along as, as we went. So I said one question, so I'm gonna ask a, a second really quick one because I'm, I bet people are wondering, have you had an outbreak? We have not had an outbreak at WIS. We have had, through our testing, and we are now north, I think we're close to 5,000 samples that we've run um, in our testing program. We have had one positive pool. It ended up being one adult at the school. And because of the way in which we, we've run it, we are therefore able to isolate that individual um, who actually had completely asymptomatic, um, and this is what we're trying to catch, by the way, which yeah. no one is coming to school with any symptoms. They fill out the form before they get here, and if anybody ticks stuffy nose or fever, they're going straight home. We're not trying to, to catch people with uh, obvious signs of anything. Uh, this teacher was asymptomatic, remained, um, remained asymptomatic, and did not feel any, you know, illness, which is oh. great, but was able to teach from home for 10 days um, Maybe. Maybe. and support the students at distance. So Suzanne, thank you for sharing your experience and more on that later. So our third panelist is Jason Kelly. And Jason is the co-founder and CEO of Ginkgo Bioworks. Uh, Ginkgo is an extraordinary company. It's actually a synthetic biology company that has traditionally worked, traditionally not that long, but um, is a relatively new company, but it has grown tremendously. It works with companies in the pharmaceutical, chemical, food, and energy industries to enable or improve their products. The company has raised almost a billion dollars in venture capital, really more to expand their capabilities. To give you a sense of their breadth, they have joint ventures to develop microbes for self-fertilizing crops, to develop antibiotics, and to help create animal-free protein products. So in 2020, wasn't a big surprise that they worked with Moderna to help optimize their vaccine manufacturing process. Um, today, we're gonna talk about an aspect of their work around testing. They have been listed for the past three years on CNBC's Disruptor 50 list of the fastest growing companies. Jason himself, um, has great academic experience. Prior to Ginkgo, he received his BS degrees in chemical engineering and biology and a PhD in biological engineering, all from MIT. So we will hear an interesting story about Ginkgo and how they got into testing and what they're doing to help schools reopen. Over to you, Jason. Thanks, Mara. Yeah, the only thing I'll say is, you know, the company is 12 years old. We, we started it in 2008 uh, out, out of grad school. So it's been it, a, yeah. it, it felt, it felt a, a 10 year overnight success. Yeah, as my yeah. dad likes to say. Yeah, the, uh, yeah. So, so we, um, uh, yeah, thanks for that introduction. It's very helpful. Uh, you know, um, like Mara said, we're, we're very proud to participate uh, and help Moderna out on the manufacturing side for the vaccine. You know, the our view on this has been you know, this is a once in a in a in a lifetime uh, biological catastrophe here that we're all living through, uh, and Ginkgo sh should find ways to help out. And so the two we identified where we thought we could plug in one was in, in speeding uh, vaccine manufacturing, working with a, a couple of the other vaccine manufacturers now too, uh, and then the second area was 
you know, not in diagnostic testing, because there's lots of companies that do that, um, but in a different problem, which was how can you use testing to monitor uh, and help uh, create safe environments to reopen uh, workplaces and schools in the middle of the pandemic, uh, while we're all still waiting to get enough vaccine to get out of this thing. And uh, that, it's a real hard problem, you know, I'll, I'll be honest. The, uh, and the key distinction is, you know, how do you even get someone to take a test when they don't have symptoms, you know, right? Like a diagnostic test, you go because you feel sick. Uh, but if you want to have people in a workplace or school sort of do these, this test, they, they have to be easy, right? You know, it has to not be disruptive to their day, right? Uh, and then secondly, it needs to be inexpensive and scalable because there's just many, many more people that don't have symptoms that you need to be, you know, monitoring regularly if you wanted to have, you know, the economy broadly reopened and, and, and you know, kind of solve some of these societal problems uh, we're facing with, with closed institutions. And so that's what we worked on. Uh, and where we landed, um, you know, Susanna mentioned this idea of sort of a pod pooling, you know, really after trying, man, we tried everything. We tried rapid antigen tests, like those kind of pregnancy style tests, all, all this is in K-12 environments. We tried, you know, saliva, this, that, and, and the one we really like the best is, is really a, a, a pod pooled collection, a classroom test, uh, where what we're doing is uh, testing all, in, in fact, in our case, uh, um, and this is, I'll talk about where we're doing this, but in Massachusetts and Maryland, uh, it's being done at very large scale, uh, but the students uh, self-swab. So each student in the class uh, will, will swab their nose, like a Q-tip, uh, so like a short swab right in the front of the nose. Uh, uh, it, it's kind of like picking your nose was, was what the video that the Baltimore Public School uh, uh, just shared yesterday with their launch of the program. Uh, and then the students walk to the front of the room and they put that swab in to, uh, into a tube. Uh, up to 25 swabs go in the same tube. Tube gets closed, scanned by uh, an administrator. The teachers don't need to do anything. They're not, they're not uh, touching the students, not interacting with the students in, in any kind of healthcare capacity way or in any, any way really, uh, they're observing. Uh, and then the uh, administrator or school nurse or someone with PPE comes by and closes the, the tube, scans it, puts it in a box and it, and it gets mailed to a lab. And, and the advantage is uh, it's about 10 minutes to do a classroom. Uh, and again, it, it doesn't require a lot of trained staff or anything like that. We onboard schools. Uh, we piloted this before we launched it um, statewide in Massachusetts uh, in 11 states around the country. Uh, to make sure we could make it easy and work in different environments. And so uh, I, I'm happy to give more details on how it works. Uh, I will say now that um, where Massachusetts rolled this out, us and then also the MIT Broad Institute are using the same type of test uh, statewide in Massachusetts. We're, we've been assigned 332 schools across 46 districts uh, representing 112,000 students and 25,000 faculty and staff that were testing weekly uh, from Massachusetts. And, and then just announced yesterday uh, the two, two of the larger school districts in Maryland uh, that represent about 20% of the students in the state. Uh, so this is Baltimore City Public Schools and Montgomery County Public Schools. Uh, for K-8, they're going to be using our technology. In high school, they're actually doing an individual test. Uh, we're happy to talk about that too. Um, but for, for about 242,000 students across those 326 schools, uh, they're also going to be doing weekly uh, testing using this pod pooled method. Uh, so really exciting uh, to see that um, uh, leadership from Massachusetts and, and Baltimore area schools there uh, and happy to discuss it uh, with the, with folks on the call today. And I'll put a couple of links in the in the chat um, that there's actually a really nice two minute video from from Baltimore that shows how easy it is. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give it back to you, Mara. That is great. Well, quick question. I'm going to ask you as well about uh, outbreaks or positive rates. Can you share with us a little bit about what you've learned around the country in your um, initial work with a lot of schools? Yeah, so, so this is technically across a lot of schools, uh, uh, but the overwhelming majority today is coming from Massachusetts. So I just want to caveat that that's really more where this data is. Within the next few weeks as Baltimore comes online, we'll also have that area as well. Um, but to give you a stat, I asked the team to pull like a recent set. So across the last close to 1989 pools, uh, we had 51 positive pools in there. Um, so about about two point, uh, I guess it's about, well, you can do the math. I think it's about 2.6%. Uh, so, uh, uh, and again, that means that one member of that classroom had it. And then the average size of the pool, um, it varies a little bit depending on the area, but it could be between 10 and 20 uh, students in that pool. So, so, that, so it's actually quite a small, if you look across the whole thing, um, the, the, uh, it, it's a relatively small, small, low amount of incidence across folks in the school, but we do catch them. Uh, and then those schools will follow up in different ways, depending on the area. 
uh, what, what they do in the case of a positive pool. Super, thank you for that. And let's, we'll come back to that in terms of that um, positive pool piece. But there are a lot of questions both in the chat and we got some ahead of time about um, two aspects that come together. One is the recent CDC guidance. How does that impact um, how you think about what you're doing in your schools, in your district, your company? Um, for Mike, many of the districts. And then related to that, how do we deal, how do schools deal with the cost of doing this? Um, is it affordable for most schools? And what kind of financial support is there without, with today without um, the new Biden um, budget for 1.9 trillion for this? So I don't know, um, Mike, if you wanna start as you've talked about um, you know, the pros and the cons of CDC guidance and how you are parsing through that for your organization. Sure. Um, well, again, I think what our members are asking and, what, and where they're trying to lead is on just as much clarity on the science as possible. And in general, I think that CDC guidance was a set a, a very helpful set of uh, benchmarks for how we should be approaching school safety. I, I would say that um, one of the things which currently seems to me to be underappreciated um, is that when the president or anyone else really uh, is talking about school reopening right now, they are tending not to be talking about fully reopening schools um, because fully reopening schools, certainly in every urban district in America, requires you to drop social distancing as a mitigation factor. There, there simply is not enough square footage in buildings. And so- uh, Mike, by that you mean the six foot rule, the six foot right. Biden slash You're rule. You're going to keep kids six feet apart and you just do the math. In the vast majority of schools, public schools in the US, there is not enough square feet footage in buildings to do that. Um, and hence, even in districts that have been um, very proactive in bringing kids all back to school. I think of a district like Hector County, Texas, for instance. Um, even in a district like that, what they've had is about 65% of their kids back consistently over the course of this year. Um, what we are going to need is not just the current CDC guidance, which is why I bring this up, but CDC guidance, which helps districts to understand the science of bringing kids fully back to school when you have high vaccination rates as one factor in your overall effort. So as I think towards the fall, what we're thinking a lot about is the sort of recipe that would include high community vaccination rates, near universal teacher vaccination rates, co comprehensive COVID testing, ventilation, uh, mask wearing. Does that recipe get you to safety? I think the science can tell us a lot about that. But part of the value of testing in schools is that local communities need to be reassured. Even if they're in basic agreement with you on the science, there's huge value in um, a sort of regular drumbeat of reassurance yeah. that, that yeah. you get from testing. Um, Super, uh, that is really helpful in this issue of the six foot rule versus, um, I've heard Susanna, you talk about the three foot rule, what they're doing in Europe. Can you give us some perspective on that? Well, I'm gonna go metric for a second. Uh, they use a meter, right? Which is very close to um, three feet. But I, I, if, I'm, if my memory serves me correctly, six feet preceded the um, discussion of masks. So six feet came out right at the beginning as we recommend this physical distance of six feet. And then there was a recommendation for wearing masks in schools. So, you know, for my part, if to get everybody back to school, um, we are in an urban setting, we do not have the space uh, to bring everybody back with the current restrictions in place. So we need to see some kind of lift of, of one of, uh, you know, physical distancing or mask, wear, uh, not mask wearing, the lift on this cohort size and the two are linked, right? Uh, they've measured, typical classrooms, you can't get more than 11 people into a classroom and, and be at that distance. So the latest CDC guidelines are interesting in that they say, if feasible, 
And so right now, the mayor in DC is still uh, preferring us to stick with six feet distancing. So we're sort of beholden to that at this point. So this is where I think, you know, the science is for, for non-scientists can be frustrating. We'd love somebody to definitively say, it's okay to do this as long as you're doing that. Um, and, but we, we sort of pick our sources and have stuck with them from the beginning. And so that's what's driving our, our operating uh, mechanisms right now. Uh, Mike talked about, you know, whole scale vaccinations. The vast majority of my faculty have had at least their first vaccination. Uh, and we, it looks like we'll be very close to having everybody who wishes to be vaccinated um, vaccinated by the middle of next month. So that's really exciting. That's and at that point, I think we can think quite differently about um, how to get back and what we want to push on um, in terms of, you know, the, the, the science out there. And Mara, so, this is a good example too, Mara. I'd just add that um, if you are in a school community where you have gotten your teacher vaccination rates up high, to the extent that there is consensus in the scientific community about transmissibility as it relates to vaccination. Political leaders need to be loud and clear about what the science says so that communities can factor that into their safety plans with a minimum amount of political um, confusion. I completely agree with that. And I think that's a, an absolute key issue. And, and thank you, Mike. Um, I'm gonna go to Jason now to talk about the issue around cost. What does pooled testing look like? And I know that you and your team at Ginkgo have done um, some work about sources of funds, both today and potentially in the future. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, so this is, a, this is a, a absolutely key issue across public schools. Um, and so one of the advantages here uh, with, with doing a pod pooled strategy is, is one, the logistics are greatly simpler. So instead of, you know, 800 tubes leaving a, a school of 800 people, you, you know, you can divide that by, you know, call it about 20 uh, and 40 tubes leave the school. So that's a lot less to, you know, things to lose and things to scan and stuff like that. So that's one of the advantages. The other advantage is cost, right? So you get to now share the cost of that molecular test because those get shipped back to be run on the same type of testing infrastructure that's used to do diagnostic testing, so PCR testing. Uh, and that cost gets spread across the, the swabs in the pool. And so what it works out to on average, like ultimately if you put more people in a, in a tube, it gets less expensive, um, but it ends up being between, call it about six and $8 per student per week, depending on the size of the pod. Um, or about, I'll call it about $150 for the classroom is, is kind of how to think about the cost. And, and schools in Massachusetts and Maryland are, are choosing both, in both cases to do testing once per week, right? So that would be your cost weekly in that case. Yeah. Um, and then you men mentioned the funding. We do actually did, uh, we've been doing a little bit of work on this. It's it certainly, a, there's, you know, the, the complicated uh, threads of how federal funding works, but there is this uh, ESSER, ESSER uh, one and two funding. Uh, we do believe that that is applicable uh, to doing um, this type of testing. Uh, and so I actually have a, I'll put a blog post in the chat that, that highlights some links where you can look. It definitely varies by state how that money is used. So, so it will ultimately, unfortunately, you'll have to look at it and figure it out in your specific state situation. But that is a recent, that, that's a pool of money that's available now. There is obviously the bill coming. Um, and, then, and then state governments, you know, if you look at Massachusetts, ultimately the state governor decided to go ahead and fund this from the state. Um, in Maryland, the uh, districts are funding it themselves. So it, it is varying. Can I, so, can I just add one, add one thing here? Um, we were, we're an independent school, so I, I do appreciate our circumstances different, but we, one of the ways we decided to go about this was to do much of the testing ourselves. So we have minimal nursing support that we bring in on testing days, but it's, we've trained up a bunch of people internally. So. I'm one of them, for example, and my associate head of school has really led the initiative here. And you know, on any given day, you might find my director of technology pipetting and moving solutions over. We've all been trained and sort of, so we have decided to kind of take the burden on that way. And that's another way for schools to consider. Um, we've become citizen scientists in all of this. And you know, it's it's going to be a choice by school, but we we decided to keep the keep the costs down for um, external staffing on this and it, it's come at a bit of a burden right uh, yeah you know, the director of communications is out for three hours every so often because she's 
She's helping bring kids down to the classroom and making uh, supervising swabbing, but we decided that was a cost well worth um, well worth considering because it's helped us, you know, financially get our heads around this. So you're literally doing the test yourself. Literally, literally. I, so I'm going to come, and I think that that's somewhat unusual, at least for the larger schools. Well, well, you know, it's it's going to be. I know, I know our scale is very different, but I, I, I popped in the, the chat here. I believe it's scalable. You're all going to have your ways of figuring this out and how you move your kids through. And for a kid, it, you know, it takes 10 minutes out of their day. Now it's gonna take much more out of the adult's day if you're gonna have the same person overseeing it. But if you set up multiple parts in your places on your campus and had a group of people overseeing it, and Jason, perhaps you could speak to, you know, your kind of test, is it feasible for, the likes of me as a as a absolutely not a scientist to to become proficient enough to be able to supervise the procedure. Yeah, so, so we thought really hard about this, and, and so there is just a distinction in the type of test you're doing, Susanna, versus what we are, and we made this choice very deliberately. Um, so you're you know you're you're using a uh, a pooled test, you're putting a bunch of samples together to reduce costs, but you're and you're doing a molecular test, a PCR test, so the stringency is low. That's great. You know you have good limited detection, great test. The difference is yours is a on-site rapid test run with like a like a little piece of equipment, right? Um, in other words, like you, there you go. Thank you. Thanks, Mara. Mara. Uh, so you actually have to do some work there. Like you're actually running the test. We decided that that was going to be infeasible for for many of the districts we were trying to work with at the scale they were running. That we wouldn't that that amount of training would just take. Unfortunately, given the amount of time left, would take too long, and many of uh, the teachers or administrators would would not want to be put in that role. Uh, and so we adopted an approach where the tests are still run at a lab. The collection is done at the school. And then even further, we decided we need to make, we need to do self collection with the students doing the collection so that the teachers don't do anything. They just observe. The students self collect, they walk to the front of the room, they put it in a tube. Literally it's close a tube, scan a tube, put it in a box, mail it. And that was a very deliberate choice to find something. And this was after, like I said, we, we have been banging on this problem for a year uh, that would, we solved the crux of the problem that we thought was keeping this type of approach out of the schools, which was, it's just the logistics are overwhelming. Like, like you know, people are like, I, yeah. I'd love to do it, but it's too much, you know? And, and, and so we felt like that meant minimize school, like minimize the impact of the school. And so, so that, that's it. It's 10 minutes in the classroom and the, and there, there isn't somebody that has to run it. Now the trade-off is, you know, ours are when the, when the samples arrive at the lab, the lab has to give a result within 24 hours. So we're not getting a result in 30 minutes, right? Our schools are gonna get the result back. You know, if they do it on Monday, they're probably gonna get the result back on Wednesday. So, so, that's, so the, that's the, that's the, that's the trade-off. It is a real trade-off, um, but, but we, this is what's made it scalable in Massachusetts and Maryland. So I'm going to give a little demo about a couple of things here, but let me hand it over to Mike. And I think we're going to go into rapid phase after this so we can get to a lot of the Q&A questions. Mike? Great. Yeah, I was just going to underscore that everything you've just heard from Susanna and uh, Jason is the reason why you need some set of tools as a school district to walk you through the logistics of your options so that you can think through things like, okay, can we actually staff what we're describing here? Um, if logistically it seems feasible to you, but in order to do it for just as an example, you're gonna have to renegotiate your collective bargaining agreement, um, then it might, it may or may not be worth it, but at least you've got a set of tools that can walk you through a decision-making tree um, and come to the best possible decision and the best option for you uh, given your local situation. And uh, as I mentioned in the chat, I put the tools that we've developed for this. They're open source, anyone can use them. Um, and I do think they're very helpful. Tremendously helpful, thank you. Thank you, Mike. So there are a number of playbooks and that have this detailed information and clearly a number of options. Let's go to some of the questions that we've gotten from our audience. Um, once, and I'm gonna go through them quickly so we can get to all of them. What about um, HIPAA and student data privacy? Uh, Jason, you wanna take that one in terms of how you deal with it? And it, I think it's pretty typical. Yeah, I mean, so, so one of the great things here is we're not collecting student data. So, so, so the, the, what, the, the swabs, when they walk to the front of the room, they go in that tube. We don't know which swab belongs to which student. 
right? What you're actually doing is you're just saying, is someone in this class positive? And so that, that actually greatly reduces that um, burden on, on the labs running those tests. And now, now it does change what happens when there's a positive pool. So maybe we'll just talk about that for a minute, Mara. So, so it, it varies in Maryland in order for simplicity. In K-8, where the, where the classrooms, uh, at least for them, are cohorted, where the students are staying together for the day, the classroom, if there's a positive, is just sent home. They're, 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 that, that classroom quarantines and the families are encouraged to go out and get testing in the community. In Massachusetts, it's different. The Massachusetts program recommends that the school actually run a follow-up test on the classroom and see who is, who's positive in the classroom. And then that way the remainder of the class could stay in school uh, um, and, the, and the positive student uh, could isolate uh, and for the quarantine period recommended by the CDC. And the way that Massachusetts is, is recommending is they're giving free uh, Binax Now tests, which are the rapid antigen tests. And those would be administered by a, by a healthcare professional with it to the to the 20 students in the class. And that would all be done through a, a, a you know, traditional HIPAA collection, like all the software and everything that, that that's now done through a careful diagnostic HIPAA compliant manner. Um, so those are just two states doing it two different ways. Um, certainly the Baltimore approach is a bit faster, but more obviously more disruptive to the school because that that class will now have to quarantine uh, for the CDC recommended period. So thank you, Jason. That's really helpful to, to understand the context there um, and how that works. Let me ask another question. I'll go to Susanna for you. High school students, you said, are different. Why are high school students different? And why are, are, are several schools e either postponing getting back to school for high school or not putting high school students in pools? So I, I think it was Jason who gave the example of a high school that's, that's um, doing them individually. Uh, look, it's an age group where you parents have less control, quite simply. And I, it's been interesting to see what's happened here in DC, but the mayor has, for example, stopped all high school sports because all of the outbreaks that they were seeing were directly relating to high school age students. Now, um, you know, you have to be fairly sure that you can you're wanting people to buy into a social contract, right? If they're gonna come back to school, you need to know that they're choosing to, to do safe things outside of school. And I think the, the general thinking is that high schoolers will not follow that advice as much. And we've seen okay. examples in this area of high schools that have really struggled to stay open because they keep having outbreaks and it's tied to social behaviors, uh, you know, parties and, uh, the, the travel sports, I think, has been a very interesting um, example. They, you know, stories of kids piling into minibuses and going off to play soccer and not wearing yeah. masks and so on. So that's, and, that's the best thinking, I think. And one thing that I'd add to that, and Mike, you may have some comments here, but no. is that um, the science would say that younger students, particularly K through eight, are less likely to transmit disease and less likely to have disease. We don't fully understand why. Um, Mike? Yeah, so I would say, first of all, to the point that Susanna just made, uh, a state like Utah, I think, has gotten great value out of what they call their test to play approach for high school athletics. Um, so they've been able to mandate that playing high school athletics means getting tested regularly. Um, and I think in that context, they are, to my understanding, not doing only pool testing, but some districts in Utah are doing a rapid antigen type approach to, to yeah. testing athletes. Um, many other of my members have reported that to the extent that they have community spread at all, it is originating on athletic teams in middle school and high school. So I, I think having a overall approach to testing that considers athletics um, and integrates an approach to testing athletes into the overall plan uh, makes a lot of sense. The other thing which just, uh, I think in many different contexts across the US is different about high school students is that some hybrid approach to their learning is possible. Um, we have evidence across our membership that there's a subset of high school students who have actually thrived in virtual learning. Um, there are no kindergartners and first graders that thrive in early literacy online. That, to my mind, doesn't exist. It's very, very hard to teach early literacy online. 
it's not necessarily hard under the right conditions to teach AP calculus online. Um, so there are just, there are differences in learning environments that factor into this as well in terms of how districts and schools are approaching the sort of ratio of in-person and out of, and out of school learning. Super Mike, thank you. Thank you for that. And I, I think I'm gonna come to Suzanne, another comment on that. The one thing that I would add though, is the disproportionate impact in low income communities where um, for many, the access to strong internet connections and to the most sophisticated computers to be doing this and using a family computer all day is sometimes prohibitive even when intellectually the students um, can easily do that. Uh, so I just need to mention the disproportionate challenge we have on equity. Susanna, you had another comment on this? I just wanted to actually, Mike just talked about the fact that of course high schoolers thrive better learning from home than their younger counterparts. And we have seen examples of schools taking their high school space and re sort of retrofitting it for primary school age students mm -hmm. to, to maximize getting those younger students back. So you know, very, very creative solutions to, to making sure those younger students who, but not only academically, but socially <laughs> run the risk of, of, of really, really suffering through this. Mar Mar just one small point. Uh, the, the Baltimore distinction between high school and K was just that uh, uh, also very practically, the high school students switch classrooms and the K student didn't uh, in their schools. And so it was harder to uh, have a cohort that wasn't interacting in the high school. And so they went with individual tests in the high school because the students are gonna be mixed. They wanna find the person and take the person out. Whereas to reduce cost and improve logistics at K-8, they went with a pooled test uh, because they could just send the whole, that whole classroom hadn't interacted with anybody else. And that, that, was, that was the major reason. Just so to be clear, Mara, quickly, um, of course there are large subsets of high school students who have struggled mightily in the virtual environment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we've also seen districts where, for instance, um, access to AP classes has expanded dramatically in the virtual setting. So they're, uh, they're, it's just a very complicated picture at the high school level. Yeah, uh, complicated, I think, is a uh, key word for the day. Um, we're going to take a couple more questions, and I want to emphasize that before the end, there have been a lot of questions that are answered by these playbooks. Uh, Chiefs for Change has worked with the Rockefeller Foundation to put together a playbook. They have another event tomorrow as well. And we're going to get to all of you the resources that are in the chat, but as a follow-up email from the event, we're actually gonna put them in all one email. So if you can get them today, terrific, but you'll also get a summary of them in email right after this. Um, I'm also gonna do a little demo, but let's go back to the talk of pods. Um, you each talked about pods and Jason, as you just talked about high school versus K through eight, how do you deal with teachers in pods? Do you put them in with their classroom? Do you put them all together? Is the PE and sports separate? Um, how do you deal with, how do you deal with that? Yeah. So, so again, schools can make different decisions here, but we, we are finding yeah. in Massachusetts where there's a wide range of different schools, uh, uh, at the, for K, um, we're often seeing the teachers being put into the same pod as the classroom. Um, and I think, I think for the, uh, it's a good qu question. I think at the high school level, more frequently yeah. you're seeing individual testing for the teachers still, uh, rather than, than putting them in the pod. Susanna, do you put your teachers in the same pod as their students? At primary school, we do because they are with that group of students all day. Um, in the case of middle and high school, we pull the teachers together and we do them in smaller groups because this is not, uh, it's not gonna sound great, but we care more about the teachers in this than we do about the students because they're, the students can still access learning from home. The teachers right, yeah, are a vital resource. So we, uh, we actually pull them in much smaller pods. And so that if we, you know, if we do end up with a positive, which we did, um, we, we then needed to do confirmatory testing with just four individuals. Right. Um, yeah, you can't have a 20, student, uh, 20 teacher pod or, or staff and then have 20 teachers have to leave. Yep until Correct. you get clarity. Yeah, uh, two, you can... two comments that I'll add here. When we talk about teachers, I believe it's fair to say all of the schools are talk about teachers and staff. We're using teachers, but it's really, I see a lot of nodding, adults in the school. So that has been a key piece of the program. 
Let me also ask uh, uh, Susanna. And any contractors, any adult on the campus. So if we have somebody here to fix the elevators or we have somebody bringing lunch in uh, and they're not actually employees of the school, it doesn't matter, they all have to um, they all have to test, including the reporter that came by to, to do a session on testing at WIS. Uh, we made him swab, uh, just like everybody else. For those Laura, instances, it's nice to have a 15 minute test. Uh, Laura, my I, I would just emphasize that um, when it comes to logistical challenges in schools, quarantining adults is by an order of magnitude more challenging than quarantining kids. And it's not just teachers. I know a school system that had a um, positive COVID test that then required the quarantining of seven custodians. It, it creates a, an impossible situation when that happens. Um, so I, I, I think what Susanna has described in terms of very small pools um, that allow for minimal sort of pinpoint quarantining of adults is really smart. So with that, and talk about complicated, as you've said, and impossible situations, all of you have talked about back to school with the missing link being testing. It, we haven't said it, but I'll emphasize that, because I, I, I know we've spoken, is that none of this testing means that you can't, that you can go without a mask, or at least some sort of distancing and hand washing, et cetera. <clears throat> Excuse me. Every time I cough, I want to say not COVID. Um, I had it, just had a test. But um, what about those who don't want to be tested? Is it still effective to do a program? Are, are any of your programs mandatory? Um, if you've got 70% of people getting tested regularly, and I'm going to focus here, Mike, on you on the public schools, on larger school system, is it still worth it if you could only get 70% of your population to agree? You know, I would say Jason can probably speak better than I can to the science of those types of ratios and what you can tell when you have that amount of buy-in and what you can't. But I would say that in general, um, a, as long as you reach a critical mass in testing, it's valuable for a couple of reasons. A anything you can do to limit the amount of quarantining you have to do is valuable operationally. Um, but the probably the bigger one is just in the le when it's when it's aligned to a good communication strategy, the level of community reassurance you get in your overall mitigation strategy. Yeah. Um, so again, as we learn more about the science, for instance, about the question of whether teachers ever need to quarantine if they've been vaccinated. Um, yeah. You, testing will provide just an extra level of assurance to the community that it's safe to come back to school. And I, I do think that effective leaders need to appeal to the common good uh, in, in all of this in the way that they communicate to their staff, which is to say, look, it, it matters that we reassure parents and kids about safety and we need you to participate in that. Super, thank you. Jason, did you have a comment on that? Yeah, so it, yeah, just to give you uh, some facts on the ground from Massachusetts. Uh, so Massachusetts, it's not uh, mandato mandatory, um, the, but parents do need to give a consent. And so we have seen, I want to say it's like 90% plus consenting. Um, and, and, and again, it, you get covered, you know, like I would agree with Mike, like a big part of this is what's the situation on the ground? Right, like we had, we had a, a school principal say it was the first time it had felt normal since March once they started doing the testing because they had a sense of okay, you know, we had no positive pools or we did, we had one, you know, and we and we handled it right. Like it, there is a a sense of participation and control that I think people have really been lacking for the last uh, year uh, that this this does give back. And I, and I will say, even the students, you know, my, I have a, a, a kindergartner and a third grader, and in my in my son's class, one of the kids had. You know, if you've had COVID within a certain period of time and it's you passed your quarantine period, you're back at, at school, you can still shed small amounts of virus that would be picked up in a very sensitive test. And so you don't want to inadvertently give a false positive, and so you, you, don't, you don't give a swab. But this student wanted to do it so badly because the other kids are doing it, right? You know, and so the teachers have them collected, like put it in the trash, right? Like so, so you actually see, I think the the students feeling a uh, a sense of. Uh, like kind of ownership and agency here uh, along with the, the teachers and staff that I think is a, is a big, big, honestly, it's a big, big part of this. The, the community element of this is huge. Uh, and, and we all have to 
collect, you know, our, our the safety is related, you know, what I do affects you. And, and so a, a big part of, of, of this is that, and, and I, and, and so I, yeah, we've seen that effect in, in the schools. So with this, um, Suzanne, just 20 seconds, then I'm going to, to wrap it up. I do believe we're gonna have a small group of people, um, adults that will not vaccinate. And yeah. it's because yeah. of personal beliefs and suspicion. And it's gonna be a real challenge for us because we would love to have a collective safety here, but however we swing it, they're not interested. I think that's, um, that's very fair and clearly true nationwide. I'm gonna answer uh, and mention one more thing as we close it up and hand it over to Nate. Um, no time for demo today, but if anyone's interested, please uh, be in touch. My email's in the chat at ASU. All of our um, participants and all of our panelists, all of our panelists have agreed to be contacted. So we will give you email addresses in the follow-up um, email as well. I'll also emphasize one thing that hasn't come up, and I guess is good news, is availability of tests. And I think that this is something that has fundamentally changed. Um, so without much detail now, I will say pretty unequivocally um, in the, the lower 48 states, and I still believe in Hawaii and uh, Alaska as well, there are enough tests to do this, whether it's in pool testing or rapid testing or even traditional PCR. Um, working with Rockefeller, we issued a report around this in December and do believe there is enough tests for schools to be able to adequately test in the ways that we've talked about today. So more on that coming up in the next few weeks. Please um, email with any questions. Let me hand it over to Nate to wrap things up. And thank you for our great panelists. And we hope that you will all, as the audience, appreciate the additional information that they shared today and um, fo in follow-up. Nate? Thank you, Mara. That's all we have time for today. Thank you for attending and we hope you enjoyed the conversation and took away some new ideas. We will be sending a post event email that will contain resources related to reopening schools, many of which were discussed today. We also value your feedback and we'll include a brief survey asking for your input about today's webinar. We would greatly appreciate your participation. We encourage you to visit asucovidcommons.com to learn about future webinars, view today's webinar recording, Take our Workplace Commons Keeping Workers Well survey that will be available next week and get the most current data on COVID tests at testingcommons.com. Please save the date for our next webinar on Thursday, March 25th at 9 a.m., where we will discuss global perspectives on COVID-19 variants, vaccines, and testing. Once again, thank you for joining us today. Stay safe and have a great one.